Welcome to another episode of Geopolitics with Alex. And I think that today we have a very special treat because with us we have uh, my good friend George Yeo, who you might know has been a general in the army of Singapore. He's been a government minister in Singapore for over 20 years. Uh, but the biggest connection that him and I had was that we were foreign ministers at the same time. And I'll never forget it because it was a UN General Assembly week. And both of us were horribly jet lagged. We didn't know each other. We ended up in the same hotel and at about three o'clock in the morning, there are two crazy people in the gym on the treadmills. And we didn't sort of say hello or anything like that. But then later on, we had a meet. Hey, you were at the gym this morning, weren't you? So warm welcome, George Yeo. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you, Alex. Great. Pleasure to be here. Now, uh, you are uh, a member of our external advisory board here at the School of Transnational Government Governance, and we're especially thankful for that. And uh, you have given a speech to us, uh, inaugurating our great lecture hall here at Buen Talenti. And the speech had many different themes, but it's really about China's role in the world right now. Can you tell us, what do we in the West get wrong with China? Why don't we understand China? What's your take? Well, well actually, my main point is the role Europe can play to balance the relationship, the struggle between the US and China. Mm. And the stance Europe takes can make the difference between war and peace on this planet. So Europe's position is very important. And Europe's understanding of China is vital to managing this, this larger relationship. So you could kind of see the situation a little bit like you have these sort of three power centers, right? Like the United States, Europe, and China. Let's begin with the, with the China United States. I'm simplifying a little bit, but there's been a lot of talk about decoupling and of course the US making China its number one competitor rival and even enemy. And there's sort of you know, support for this idea across the aisle. How, how do you see the US approach to China? What, what, what are the problems there? What are the good sides and the bad sides? I think he had to, he had to come sooner or later. But in the last five years, like drops of litmus, like drops of acid changing the color of the litmus. No, no. There's suddenly a view in the US that China is a threat. Not a threat to the US in the territorial sense, but a threat to US dominance mm. in the world. And there's a mood in the US now that they must somehow curb, curtail, control, contain China, and if necessary, for some, go to war with China. Mm. And this is very dangerous because the passions of a uh, democratic electorate can sometimes get out of control. If, for instance, there's an incident in the South China Sea and a few dozen US sailors were to be killed, then Congress, the US media will react in a way which even the White House cannot, cannot somehow contain or moderate. Yeah. I would assume, and having listened to your speech, that the US is probably on a wrong track here from your perspective, and, and that they are sort of getting China wrong. Well, if you were the president of the US, what would you do? Well, the, 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 the most important thing is to understand the nature of the challenge, and which means understanding China in its history, mm. in its philosophical underpinnings. Otherwise, if, you, if your assumptions are wrong, then your actions may lead not to success, but to tragedy. So it's important when we look at China, not just to view it on the basis of a few snapshots, yeah. but one must watch the entire video from its early beginnings. Yeah. Then its nature reveals itself. And China has a long history. And China is the challenge it is because it has a long civilization. The Chinese people are the biggest nationality in history. Mm. Why has this come to be? It wasn't an accident. Uh, China, with a population of 1.4 billion, is 92% Han. How can such a large country be so homogeneous? It cannot be by accident. 
it cannot be because of uh, the policies of one or two dynasties. It is deep in the culture that they they are most comfortable among themselves. We take Europe. Europe has about maybe half the population of China. Hey. And we're in Italy. Hey. We are in Florence. You are from Finland. Each has its history, its, its traditions, its heroes, its myth. But the whole of China has only one literature. Has only one set of myths to which all Chinese people sus- subscribe to. And because of the nature of this civilization, it has a very different uh, character. The Chinese people are not expansionists, not because they can't be expansionists, but they find it troublesome to incorporate you know, Chinese people into the area. Sounds a little bit like the Finns sometimes. You know? <laughs> yeah, we're, really. yeah, we're only 5.5 million, very peculiar language and no one else speaks it. But I, I guess what I was struck by when I you know, read your speech and, and then listened to it is you could also make a comparison, I guess, to India to a certain because India will now surpass China in terms of population, but it is, of course, a little bit more diverse, much less homogenous. And in your speech, you also talk about you know the notions of harmony are the notions of a sort of a legalistic perspective. Can you explain that a little bit? No, India is much more like um, Yeru. Hmm. It has a common civilizational basis in the Hindu and Islamic beliefs. The way Yeru would have Judeo-Christian values and the inheritance of Greece and Rome. Hmm. Uh, but politically, India has never been united until the British came. And hmm. it has no political culture of being united over centuries. For China, it's like Rome resurrecting itself again and again in European history. Europe never did. I mean, not, not that there were not attempts by Charles the Great or by Frederick Barbarossa or by uh, Bismarck or Hitler or whatever, or Napoleon. But China always did. So there is a political culture of being, of seeing the ideal in being a united Poverty, and then makes it very different from Europe and from India. So, what, what what do you say when you hear you know a lot of Westerners, people from the global South, or you know the US and Europe saying, oh, you know, China is an authoritarian, centralized state. You know, it's expansionist or imperialist, just like Russia, and we need to decouple and the rest. I mean, what, what's your you know as a Singaporean, what's your reaction? Well. I'm ethnic Chinese. Singapore is three-quarters Chinese, so I think we do have some understanding of the nature of China. I don't think they they see profit in conquering foreign lands, yeah. in incorporating foreign nationalities into the body politic. In the end, it will lead to Greece. They're quite happy for the Americans to play their role, not because they don't want to challenge America, but they think that in the end, it will lead to no good. They are too old. They have seen too much to see benefit in trying to impose their values on others. Their approach is this. I have not problems with my family. It's a big family. I don't have problems. And your family, well, good luck to you. you know? <laughs> <laughs> to think that I can help you solve your family problems is to them absurd. Yeah. Just as you cannot solve my family problems. How about Chinese patience? Where where does that come from? Because I've you know I've always read stories about oh you know for the Chinese a century is only a page in a book kind of a thing, and there seems to be that you compare that to a lot of other big powers around the world. A lot of other powers they can be aggressive, they can be quite quick in their moves. You know the American century was the last century, but before that it wasn't really. How about China and patience? Where does it come from? From, from a sense of their own history. Because this, the, the dramas are reenacted on the same plains, along the same rivers, surrounded by the same mountains. And for everything they do, they can't avoid precedence. There is no country on earth which is as wedded to its own history as China. It's not possible to have any conversation in China without recurring references to what has been done in similar situations in the past. That makes it a very conservative civilization. Mm. It's always been autocratic. Such a vast land mm. cannot be organized in any other way. Mm. So the hope that you can somehow make China in the image of Western Europe, mm. it's a pipe dream. Mm. 
I think you're right. And interesting enough, I mean, you know, I, I belong very much to the sort of Fukuyama school, end of history. And, you know, I believed also that, you know, after the end of the Cold War, all of us would revert to liberal democracy, market economy, and globalization. And with that, also China, there was this feeling. But of course, China is a different kettle of fish. It's very much centralized around the Chinese Communist Party, and it's what, 88 plus uh, million members. And, and in, in that sense, you don't see much change happening on that front. China has a long history, but most of that history is of China as uh, an empire where legitimacy of the emperor is based on the male line, mm. the ruling house. That's what conferred legitimacy on an emperor. Mm. And when he loses the medal of heaven, then there's a period of turmoil, and a new dynasty, a new family comes to position. China has a very short experience as a republic. Yeah. It's only 1911. And that revolution from imperial China, the republican China, created probably, in my view, the greatest revolution in human history. And the liberation of women in that revolution yeah. is almost unbelievable because Everybody had harems, not just the unproof. Men had harems, wealthy men, and it was accepted. Hey. And women who were in high society had their feet bound for the sexual pleasure of men. So for all that to change within the short period was remarkable. And among Asian women, if you compare Chinese women to Japanese, to Korean, to Indian, to Malay women, Chinese women are the most liberated. That was because of the 1911 revolution. But how to organize politically, how to confer legitimacy on government, this is still an ongoing experiment in China. And how do you then believe, I mean, if this is getting more about China than I expected, but it's always good with a free flow of conversation. So, so you take, you know, 1979 and the opening of, of China. Do you see this continuing? Because of course, China has gone from rugs to riches. I mean, you talk a lot about it yourself as well. We've, we've seen it become the, one of the biggest economies in the world. I think in the speech, you even talked about it being about you know, half of the world's economy by 2050, et cetera, et cetera. Will opening of China continue economically? Yes, because the, the Chinese people want to do better. They are right now per capita, maybe 20% of US per capita. Surely they can reach half of US per capita. By which time the Chinese economy will be equal to that of the US and the EU combined mm. because of the logic of numbers. Mm. And that desire for a better life uh, is unstoppable, regardless of how it's governed. But when China is well governed, then the infrastructure is in place, the progress will be very, very uh, rapid. But if China is misgoverned, if corruption infects the system, then a cancer develops. And Xi Jinping, for all the criticisms of him, did one thing very great, which was to reverse the tendency towards greater and greater corruption in China, which has always been the bane of Chinese dynasties. And he was quite tough on that, I think, straight from the beginning. I also remember actually meeting him a couple of times when I was foreign minister. He was vice president, and I'm sure you did as well. Yes. Uh, but he, he, to me, seemed like a sponge. He wanted information. And every time you talked to him, it was always very much, oh, corruption is the worst thing to society. And he pushed that. Yeah. Can we then, yeah. for, for which he, he made many enemies, many people yeah. would want him dead. So I've always felt that he's a man who's prepared to die in order to stamp out corruption mm. in China. Let's go to Europe and China then. You began by saying that you have a feeling that Europe could play a big role. So let's put you now in the, first you were in the shoes of the US president, now I put you in the shoes of, of the commission president uh, or a European leader. What should Europe do here? Europe is a great experiment in bringing tribal nations together in a, in a confederation. I was at the, the archives uh, recently and it was interesting seeing how the foundations of Europe were carefully put into place over many decades. 
And these foundations lay the basis of a human experiment that despite differences of history, even of values, you can all come together, create meta values, deal with each other as brothers and sisters. This is the European experiment. And if it succeeds, it sets an example for the world. I feel very proud in being a part of the School of Transnational Governances. This is a school filled to delve into, to improve the European experiment. And you invite foreigners to join you, to understand why, what Europe is trying to do. If Europe succeeds, it's a lesson for the entire world. You need the Western alliance with the Americans for a collective defense. But Europe has its own destiny from America, which is far away, which is surrounded by two oceans. I mean, Europe is complicated at one end of Eurasia. It's always had its internal tensions. It is not an enemy of China. It's too far away. And China can never be an enemy of Europe. So what role does Europe play in the coming decades? In this titanic struggle between China and the US, if Europe maintains the balance, there'll be no war. The Americans cannot go into war with China with Europe not supporting it. Good point. China cannot go into war with America, with Europe not supporting it. Okay. But this requires a strategic view of Europe, not only geopolitically, but also historically. China may, may have been a very good civilization, but Europe in all its diversity is probably contributed more to human civilization than any other continent. Because of its diversity, its ceaseless internal struggle. So, you know, one of the interesting things is, of course, if you look at the way in which China discusses or pitches the West, it separates between Europe and the US. Whereas Russia sees very much the West as, you know, Europe and the US together. So there's a quite a sort of fundamental difference in the approach. Now, you mentioned the word, word war a few times. And of course, a lot of it, you know, again, from a simplistic uh, Western view comes to the question of Taiwan. So tell me, what's your take on Taiwan? Because I think it might be a little bit different from what we hear in the West often. Taiwan is only a piece on a geopolitical chessboard. Many people support uh, Taiwan, support Taiwan not because they know very much about Taiwan, or because they really love Taiwanese people, but because they see it as a way of somehow controlling uh, China, keeping China down. It's a way of poking China. Mm. But they don't realize that for China, Taiwan is a matter of historical justice. Uh, before the Second World War ended in the Cairo Conference, which was attended by Stalin, Churchill, Roosevelt, and Chiang Kai-shek, it was already agreed that Taiwan would be restored to China after the war. And in post time, the Cairo Declaration was reaffirmed. So for China, all the victorious powers agree that Taiwan is part of China. And it's a matter of time. Of course, they prefer to be peaceful. But they cannot give up the possibility of the use of force any more than Madrid can allow Catalonia to declare uni unilateral independence or London agreed to Scotland declaring unilateral okay. independence. So you, that is not your preference because we're the same people. But you cannot say, I will not. Because if you don't, then independence is almost a foregone conclusion. The Chinese see many Western powers talking about Taiwan as if it is just a card to be played. But for them, you know. So when the German foreign minister, Baerbock, visited China recently, State Councilor Wang Yi said something which to me was deeply emotional. He said, we supported German reunification. We hope Germany will support Chinese, re Chinese reunification. And Germany was an aggressor power, whereas China was a victim. So if there was moral cause for German reunification, the moral cost for Chinese reunification is greater. Now, does China want to invade Taiwan? 
Of course not. And that's the reason why in 2015, Xi Jinping met Ma Yingqiu, who was then the president of China, in Singapore as an equal. They had dinner at shangri I was with the Kwok bit then. They told me that the bill was split 50 50. <laughs> and, and, and the Xi Jinping brought Mao Tai, which is 52%. And Ma Yingqiu, not to be outdone, he brought Jingmen Kao Liang, which is also 52%. Both are very good leakers. Yeah. <laughs> and the words expressed that evening were highly emotional. Mm. Xi Jinping took risks meeting the Taiwanese leader as an equal. It was never done before. He did it not for Ma Yingqiu, who was stepping down. He did it for the current president before she took him. But she's decided that, no, it's better not to have a uh, one China consensus because she's from a political party called the DPP. Yeah. And the DPP, the first article in the political platform of the party constitution says, our mission is to establish an independent republic of Taiwan. So China is wondering when the US plays Taiwan, is it your objective to keep us divided forever? If that is your objective, then there'll be war. But if your objective is gradual conversions, then naturally there'll be peace. Now, what position does Europe take? But frankly, I think many European leaders take positions without, without knowing the history. And therefore, uh, ambling into a minefield without realizing it is a minefield. I remember the speaking notes I would always have when I met Chinese counterparts. Mm-hmm. So remember to mention one China policy. That was, that was always, always the one. But of course, Taiwan has now, I mean, I mean do you see any parallels in between Russia and Ukraine? Because that would be probably the pushback that you would get is that, you know, this is about territorial integrity and sovereignty. But your interpretation, of course, of the historical aspect of it is completely different from what we see in Russia and Ukraine. So I, I, I would assume you don't see those as similar in any which way. Or how do you... No, the, the Chinese are co- consistent. They say territorial boundaries should not be changed by force. Mm. So they oppose Russia changing territorial boundaries by force as much as they oppose others wanting to keep Taiwan separate from China. Mm. And... Um, They, they don't say it, but by implication, they oppose Russia's invasion. But they also say that that invasion had a history. You can't see one snapshot and form a conclusion. You have to watch the video. Yeah. And if you want a solution, you must watch the video. You can't just look at the snapshot. Actually, before we come to the conclusion of our talk, which has been fascinating, you know, my sort of sentiment right now is that if China really wanted to win the hearts and the minds of the global West, it would actually be the main peace mediator here. In a sense that I have a feeling that the only person who can call Putin right now and say, listen, Vladimir, time to stop this, is Xi Jinping uh, himself. So, you know, do you think we're going to move into that kind of a direction where, where China takes that role on the grand stage? Uh, not in that way. I think there would be, if conditions are right, and they can play a catalytic role. They will play that role. But they do not see themselves as power brokers, as someone who can bring contending sects together. This is a distant war for them. If Europe and Russia are neighbors on China's borders, then they may take a more interventionist approach. But for them, this is far away. And they don't believe, they fully understand the history of that conflict. And therefore, they're quite respectful to the fact that there's no panacea. But they said something recently which, which moved me. You know? They said, you can't negotiate if in your heart you don't open up to the possibility of reconciliation. It begins with the human heart. Hey. If both sides see a zero sign, then there can be no peace. Yeah. That is always, I think, the most difficult thing with finding the war and peace. And then there are, of course, nations and societies that are able to cope with their past. I would argue that Germany was quite good at that after World War II. But then probably, you know, I say this as a Finn, 
uh, Russia has made very well at dealing with its Soviet past. But these are the types of difficult dilemmas. Now let's move to the final one. Let's go to the thing spiritual. Now, many of you might not know, but but George is a devout Catholic and he's actually worked for the Holy See as well as an advisor. And uh, at the same time, you have a tremendously broad grasp of different religions. You've worked for universities. You know, a lot of your writings are about Hinduism and Buddhism and the rest of it. But there's one striking, lovely example that you've written about. You have compared the Catholic Church to China. Can you tell us about that? Well, I tell my European friends that we sometimes say that China is mysterious. I say, China is not mysterious. I say, you understand the Catholic Church as Europeans. See China in the same way. Uh, the Pope, like the Emperor, uh, Priests, like Communist Party cadres, all speeches making moral references, which makes all speeches boring <laughs> because uh, the, it's the nuances which matter. But it means that you've got to go through everything to find where the nuances are. But they, for the Chinese, it's not possible to give a major statement of policy without references to the past, to precedents, and to what it seemed to be ideal. It makes the speeches boring. But if you are in that system, you know immediately where the changes are. It's like the way Catholics read paper encyclicals. They're boring. But in certain paragraphs, oh, there's a change here. There's an additional statement there. Mm. And that's where the delta is. Uh, you know, both are not as autocratic as people think. Mm. The Catholic Church appears autocratic. But religious orders will all vote. Cardinals vote to elect the new Pope. Mm. But once you're in position, you have authority because it's a large congregation and you need authority to create unity. But there is no uh, arbitrary imposition. The Pope does not. He, he cannot. Just uh, on the basis of him makes decisions. You always say, go through the process. And when finally it comes to him, then you will decide. The same system applies in China. And it's useful for Europeans when they find China mysterious to say, look, think of China as a Catholic Church, that everything becomes much clearer. I think it's a wonderful way to uh, end it. George, many thanks for uh, being here with us and having a discussion. And to all of our viewers, uh, I think this has been one of the most fascinating conversations that we've had. Our aim is to break it basically give depth and understanding from different perspectives around the world on what is going on in geopolitics right now. I at least come out of this conversation understanding China much better than I used to. Hope you do as well and hope to see you soon in the next episode. 朋友都知道我是很挑剔的。防晒乳我选Kate皇家呵护抗光清爽高防晒凝露。因为它有媲美蓝光神盾的炸造植萃。保护我在阳光下延缓肌肤老化维持青春弹力可以防御工作环境里的三 Care 抗光清爽高防晒凝露